Extend to you the grace, mercy, and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ this morning, our first Sunday of Lent, as we are now to the color of purple, the color of penance as we reflect on our need for the salvation given to us by the grace of God through his Son, Jesus Christ. The gospel serves as our text for this morning's meditation. Please join me in prayer. Father, we give you thanks for sending Jesus Christ as our champion into this world, the champion of light who conquers the champion of darkness. Help us, O oh Lord, that when we face that champion of darkness, that Jesus, our champion of light, stands next to us and has equipped us and emboldened us to stand firm so that the devil may be resisted and in our resistance flee from us. Help us to utilize the gifts that our Christ has given us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends in Christ, a couple years ago, Cecilia and I, we took a trip to Italy got a chance to visit that city of Rome. And one of the things I've always wanted to see was the Colosseum. We got into that Colosseum and it's very fascinating and interesting as history just seems to come alive. This is where people died. This is where people, they said, faced beasts and other animals that would rise up from the sands and trap doors. They didn't even know where to look or where they would be coming from. It was all designed for suspense for the thousands of people that bought tickets to watch this event. Fascinating thing. And in the time of Roman history, there was the knowledge of those gladiators who had fought in these arenas. And these gladiators were usually slaves who were owned by rich people. And they would have many gladiators, but only the best of them would be known as a champion. And they would put their champions against each other as the main event. Kind of like we see in UCF these days, ultimate championship fighting. And everyone would buy tickets to see the main event of these two strong champions going against each other. And I kind of wonder if Martin Luther was thinking of this when he wrote his mighty fortress. And uses the metaphor in 657 of the LSB, now a champion comes to fight. A champion comes to fight. In Jesus Christ, the champion of light arrives into this world to take on the champion of darkness. And we get to sit back and watch the event and don't have to pay anything for it. We get to sit back and see our champion go to work to reclaim something that was lost years and years ago in the Garden of Eden where everything was plush and everything that man needed to survive and have happiness was given. There was nothing that was lacking except somehow the champion of darkness came into that garden and convinced Adam and Eve there was something lacking, knowledge of good and evil. God didn't give it all to you. And if you were to eat of this tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will be like God and you won't need him anymore because you got it all. Well, a sinless Adam and Eve fell into sin. The champion of darkness defeated God's servants. Well, to reclaim all that, God had to send his son, Jesus Christ, in this world, the true champion of light. And I find it fascinating that the arena is changed. In the Garden of Eden, you had it all taken care of. Beautiful, lush garden. But in this arena, we're talking sands, we're talking desert, we're talking wilderness. It seemed like it would not be a good place to take on the champion of darkness. But our Father puts the champion of light into that arena. And not only does he do that, but he insists that his champion of light has a 40-day fast. I mean, he really handicaps our champion, don't you think? 40 days of living in the wilderness without any food. And then, after 40 days, Luke says he's hungry, and the devil knows exactly where to go. The champion of darkness is not going to miss the opportunity. And he begins the temptation. The champions go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. And here the champion of darkness says, the champion of light, hey, Jesus, you know, about 40-some days ago, you had this great event at a baptism, and the skies were opened, and a voice was out there saying, you are my son, my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. You had this great event. 
So um, I don't know if I believe that. I don't know if I believe that all that was said at your baptism. So if you are the Son of God, he challenges Christ's identity. As the gladiator, the champion of darkness, throws a net to ensnare Christ over his identity. If you are Son of God, prove it to me. Show me. And do this. Why don't you stop your fast and take care of your hunger pains and take this stone and turn it to bread? Just do it. Jesus, our champion, takes an evasive maneuver from the net and he stands up, pulls out his sword, which we know as the word of God, and says to the champion of darkness, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. In other words, what Jesus was standing up and saying to the devil was, I don't need to prove to you who I am. I know who I am. I don't need to prove it to you. Second of all, you know, you don't need to tell me when I'm to be done with my fast. I will be done with my fast when my father tells me I'm done with my fast. If I submit to this, I am listening to another spirit than who I am called to listen to, which is my father in heaven. I will not fall into the temptation. I will end my fast when my father tells me to end my fast. So I will wait for the word. Man does not live on bread alone, but by the word of God. I will wait for the word. With the word of God, therefore, our champion of light takes a slash at the champion of darkness, and he begins to bleed. The champion of darkness looks at his wound and shrugs it off. He takes out his dagger of self-preservation, and he shows Jesus, according to what Luke says, all the kingdoms in the world in a moment, which is really odd. I don't know how you do that, but... Scripture says this is what's done. Here Jesus sees all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil again says this temptation. You know, you've come to win the world. I know you've come to win the world. You know, St. Paul tells him that too. You know, Christ, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So we all know that Christ is coming to win the world. The devil says, hey, I got it. It's, it's all mine. Again, he, he feigns a move to see whether or not Jesus will fall for it. He feigns it. He fakes it. Jesus doesn't fall for it. The devil's trying to get him to believe that he could actually give him the world. He's trying to get Jesus to believe that he could have the world without having to go to the cross. Jesus, you want the world... I can give it to you. Your father says you can have the world, but you got to go on a cross. you got to go suffer. And you, got, you want to go through all that pain? Don't do it. I can do this for you. I can do it. I can give it to you. All yours. Just fall down and, and worship me. And Jesus, again, makes the evasive maneuver, takes out the sword, the word of God, slashes the champion of darkness one more time, saying, it is written, you shall worship the Lord God only, and only him shall you serve. The devil, the champion of darkness, falls to his knees. But he's not done. He gets back up on his feet. And somehow, mysteriously, he's able to take our champion of light, put him on the pinnacle of the temple, and says, okay, okay, you... I've convinced me you really trust your father. That's great. You know, you trust him to take care of you. You trust him to tell you when the fast is over. Let's, let's see how trustworthy you are. Because it's written in the scriptures about Psalm 91 that God will send his angels concerning you so that if you were to fall, your feet will not strike against the stone. You will not be hurt nor harmed. Take a leap, Jesus. Take a leap of faith. Jump. Show me your trust in your Father. Jesus does not fall for that temptation. He stands strong. Our champion of light still continues to be victorious in his battle with the champion of darkness. And he says, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. You're asking me to test my Father. You're asking me to test my trust in him. That is wrong. I will not do it. Because if I do it, 
I have failed as the Messiah. And the devil, he knew what he was doing. He knew the word of God. He just kind of twisted and contorted it, just like in the Garden of Eden. And this time as he twists and contorts it, he's trying again to say, you know, you want to be the Messiah. Psalm 91 is known to be the proof text for a Messiah. So if you were to jump and angels come, you survive the fall, you get to be the Messiah, Jesus. Everyone's going to say, wow, he must be the Messiah. Psalm 91 right here. He must be the king. And you don't have to go to the cross. You see, the devil's out there trying to get Jesus to fall using self-preservation and avoidance of pain as a great temptation, and Christ stands firm. The devil is dropped to the ground again, and he crawls out of the arena. And this bothers Christians as you look at the last end versing of the gospel today, that the devil left him, the devil crawls out of the arena to wait for a more opportune time. Why didn't our champion of light just finish him off? Don't know. But there was more opportune time that came, right? Think about it in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's when the human flesh is really crying out, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Human flesh was like, I want to avoid the pain. God, if you've got another way to save the world, not the way the devil says I can have the world, but do you have another way than the cross? Is it possible? But then the divine nature of our champion comes to the forefront, ending the prayer, not my will, but your will be done. That was not done at the Garden of Gethsemane. He's still present at that cross when he's got Jesus nailed right up there. And he thinks he's got this battle won. And there are people saying the same phrase before Christ. If you are the Son of God, that phrase again. If you are the Son of God, take yourself off this cross. As, as Jesus could have turned stones into bread, he could have taken himself off the cross too. But he was not there to prove his identity at that time. And it was not his Father's will for him to come off that cross. It was his Father's will to die on that cross, not to save himself, but to save you and me. Jesus the champion of light wins on Good Friday. And this is one of the biggest mysterious events in human history, that something that looks like defeat is victory. And when Christ says on the cross it is finished, that is not a statement of defeat, it's a statement of victory. And Christ continues to reveal that victory as he's raised again from the dead three days later. The outcome of the war is no one. But the champion of darkness has not been finished off yet, has he? Now he comes after us. And it doesn't seem as easy for us as it did for our champion of light. C.S. Lewis once said about who the devil wishes to attack, it's not the unbeliever. The unbeliever he already has, so why does he worry about that one? He worries about the one who's crossed the line into faith. You've crossed the line, he's going to want you to cross back. And you're all here this morning, I understand you've crossed the line. And so the devil is around you seeking to bring you back into darkness. But don't be afraid, because the champion of light has not left us unequipped. According to the book of James, it says there, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Yes, we have the power to make the devil run. We have it. The champion of light has equipped us so to do. And he's equipped us with these things that we find in Ephesians chapter 6. <clears throat> the great text of what Paul has to say. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor, full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and have done everything to stand firm. And now he lists the equipment Christ has given us. Having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. 
In addition to all, take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take up the helmet of salvation and use the same sword our Lord did, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Yes, we know the outcome of the war. D-Day in the spiritual battle has taken place on Calvary. And now we just wait for the submission. But in the meantime, for some unknown reason, God allows that champion of darkness to survive and to test and tempt his people. But we are given the power and the tools to stand up, to stand firm, and to resist the devil so that he will flee from us by the power the champion of light gives us all. In his name, amen.